I cannot imagine, especially in this day and age where you or your loved ones go missing without a single clue, nothing. No evidence, no footprints, no fingerprints, no whereabouts. You just disappear and no one knows where you are and you are missing for years. Unfortunately, that's the case for this beautiful girl named Elaine Park who went missing on January 28th, 2017, now almost five years ago. She was 20 years old at the time and she would be 25 years old today. She's still somewhere out there and the family's still looking for her. People wonder if this is a case of a complete stranger having something to do with this or her difficult past involving her friends and family that could be related to her disappearance. Do these last known CCTV footages of her tell a suspicious story or not? This case literally has so many clues, yet no clues at the same time, and it just fascinated me. Kind of like the case that I did with Adnan Syed of him murdering his girlfriend, Heyman Lee. This case is a little bit similar to that in the terms of amount of research, amount of rumors and suspicions and speculations that is out there. And in order for me to spend my full time and attention to these cases, I just want to say big thank you to all my viewers. You guys really encouraged me to really find cases that not a lot of people know about. This is considered still an active investigation, so if you guys know any information about this case, I'll put all the links down below that you guys need. Elaine Park was born on September 24th, 1996. She was around 5 foot 6 and 125 pounds. She also has some tattoos on her arms. You could take a look right here. She also had a nose ring. She was last seen with long black hair with bleached tips. Her race is Korean, but I believe she was born and raised in US California and she also has a younger brother. During her teen years, her parents got a divorce and she lived with her mother in La Crescent, California. Her personality is known to be very outgoing, bubbly, she is not shy. She makes friends easily, she also cheered in high school. She also loved to attend festivals like Coachella and one of the things that she loved to do is write lyrics to music. She wrote poems, she wrote lyrics to rap, she rapped herself, she also acted and she attended small roles in TV films. Decorate and decorate, eventually make a house a home. I want to have movie nights and toast from some place out in Rome. I want to shop for pots and pans at Sur La Table. I want to eventually have minis that look up to me and call me mom. I want to. She was such a creative and a bright girl. After Elaine graduated high school, she attended Pierce College in LA. And on the outside, it seemed like she was very bubbly again, creative, having the fun, best life of her youth. But on the inside, it seems like she was dealing with a lot of personal stuff that we will get into throughout this video. I mean, we don't know if it's really related or not, but I think it's crucial to talk about. So let's talk about the night before she disappeared. And she was with her on and off again boyfriend named Divine. Divine was 19 at the time and again Elaine was 20. According to Divine and some people, it seems like both of them were not like official boyfriend and girlfriends, but at the same time they were dating and seeing each other. I mean, but regardless, like at the end of the day, they were seeing each other. Divine is known to be the son of a successful film producer parents and he lives in California. Calabasas. It's an area known for the wealthy and the celebrities of Hollywood. Elaine and Divine began seeing each other at some time around November of 2016. And these text messages just show you what kind of, in my personal opinion, as I read the text, a very chill, loving relationship. I really didn't see too big of a red flag, honestly. The conversation really seems like the typical teenager, 19, 20 year olds relationships that you have. It seems like everything was going well until the beginning of January. It seems like Elaine was going through some personal stuff and January 3rd, Elaine texts Divine claiming that she wanted to work on herself. So a lot of people take this as kind of taking a break or breaking up. Again, in my personal opinion from the text that I've seen, it doesn't seem to have anything really red flag. Um, he doesn't seem controlling or anything out of the ordinary except for the fact that her friends claim that they both were doing some illegal drugs were involved you know whenever they probably went out partying just to put that information in there from january 20th they start to kind of talk again and divine says you can't hold all that in let it out what's going on so it seems like he knew what elaine might have been going through inside internally we will talk about later what divine said about this message and what he knows that she was going through 
On the night before she disappeared, it seems like the two decided to see each other, have a little movie date. On January 27th, 2017, at around 10 20 p.m., they went to the movies. Elaine did have her own car, but for whatever reason, according to Divine, he claims that she wasn't fit to drive. So they decided to take an Uber to the movies and back. According to friends and family, they guessed that the reason why she wasn't fit to drive was because they probably smoked some green stuff. After the movies, they came back to Divine's place or his parents' place and they decided to spend the night. According to Divine, he believes it was around 4 a.m. when she woke up in a panic, shaking, singing, and left his house at around 6 a.m. without any explanation. He claims that she got dressed so fast and just decided to leave, didn't say anything, and left. It is presumed that Divine might have gotten the time wrong because in the CCTV footage, there is a timestamp of exactly when she she left. She is seen in the CCTV footages of leaving the premises and driving off with her own car out of the gated community. The interesting thing is the footage cuts off about five minutes after she leaves, which some people say is a convenient error, but this error is by the police. They claim that this happens pretty frequently when they are transferring, you know, CCTV footages into the computer or whatever, and some of the files just get deleted. We'll come back to Divine, but let's move on to Elaine's mother, Susan. Now, Elaine's mother, Susan, does confess that her and Elaine, actually the whole family, never really had like a loving, typical family relationship. Susan claims that she was adopted and she found out later in life and just the things that she went through in her own childhood she believes led to her having like this unloving relationship with her whole family. It is known that Elaine and Susan really fought a lot about a lot of things and they decided to really live separate lives. And Elaine's mother, Susan, really didn't know what Elaine did day to day. They only talked briefly about maybe money and whenever they decided to talk about something, they got into fights. Susan's behavior towards Elaine and her own daughter is very controversial. For example, on this day, Elaine was supposed to pay back the $20 to her mother by 6 p.m. sharp. When Elaine did not pay the money back at 7 p.m., Susan texts her what happened to the money. Elaine texts her mother to give her time by the end of the night. Susan texts her to keep your word. When Susan didn't see money from Elaine till the next morning, she started to call and text her about the money again and again. Susan tried to reach out to Elaine the next day on the 28th multiple times until around 3 p.m. when her phone went off. It is noted that Elaine would go off on spontaneous trips and not tell the family for multiple days. I guess this time Susan's motherly instincts start to kick in a little bit and she believed that this time was very different than the other times that she would not tell them. When Elaine did not come home for two days, Susan reported this to the police. They told her that because she is an adult, 20 years old, she should wait a day. And finally, on January 30th, there was an official missing persons report. And just like that, days passed by, and on February 2nd, five days since she went missing, her car was found abandoned 20 miles from Divine's house, approximately 45 minutes drive on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. The strange thing is, her car ignition was turned on, but the battery was dead. So the engine wasn't on, but the battery was on. Her bag, laptop, her two cell phones, ID, cash, everything was left behind. And according to the police, it was neatly left behind. So it doesn't look like there was a struggle unless someone put it and organized it neatly on purpose. Also, no blood was found on her car. Now clearly whatever happened, it seems like Elaine did not intend to run away or leave for that long, especially if she left the car battery on. According to people who live there, this area, this high way has a lot of people, a lot of traffic, no matter what time of the day or night. And it's known to be relatively a safe area. There were some searches that went on near the area, anywhere that Elaine could be, or even her body could be, and even including cadaver dogs and helicopter was called to try and look for her and nothing. So in terms of physical evidence, this is it. 
Cadaver dogs also could not find any trace of scent of Elaine minus her car. So it seems like to the police and a lot of people, they believe that her car was dropped off there and something happened in another area. So without any physical evidence, people start to look into the people that Elaine was the closest with before she disappeared. And we're going to talk about Elaine's mother, Susan, first. So there were a lot of moves made by Susan that a lot of people did not understand. For example, the day that she went missing and the day before, people wanted to see what Susan was texting Elaine. But Susan claims that she deleted all the texts between her and Elaine because she has this kind of like OCD kind of problem when it comes to like keeping a lot of clutter in her phone. But people don't understand why Susan would delete the text between her and Elaine if Elaine never responded to her text, and especially now that she is missing and haven't been home. In a way, I do kind of understand because I know that older people, especially even my parents, like they delete a lot of stuff, not much anymore. Back in 2017, even my parents, when they had iPhone like eight or something, seven or eight, my mom would always ask me to delete emails and things. She just did not like that red notification on her phone. So in a way, I kind of do understand. But at the same time, your daughter's missing and to delete all evidence and traces on your phone with her is it's just too much. I would like to note that Elaine had two phones that the police found in her car. One was her old phone that just did not turn on and her current phone that she was using. It was returned to her mother and her mother tried to unlock the phone but you only get 10 passcode attempts and she used all of them up and her phone went into a passcode lock mode. So they could not even open her phone to check what happened within the last 24 hours because the last 24 hours was not backed up into her iCloud in her computer. Also very strange, Elaine's Facebook login history was a Raised. It was deleted and no one knows who's done this. Just two months since Elaine has been missing, Susan claims that she was getting ready to rent out Elaine's room because of financial hardship. She also put Elaine's cats up for adoption and it was taken by a shelter. According to the shelter, one of the cats got sick immediately after being placed due to the stress of being abandoned and they actually had to euthanize one of the cats. The podcast crew of To Live and Die in LA were able to rescue one of her other cats and it was returned to Elaine's brother. And Elaine's brother actually did not know that his family cat that he grew up with was put up for adoption by his own mother. On month three since Elaine went missing, Susan started to get rid of Elaine's furniture in her room and thank god the podcast crew actually came to grab her furniture before the dumpster truck came to dispose of it which is crazy how can any family member get rid of their family member stuff that they went missing like who knows when she's gonna come back how do you know that she's not gonna come back and what if she comes back and sees all her belongings in her room being rented out to someone else her cats being put up for adoption like it is this is one of the biggest controversy and the act that Susan did that a lot of people just don't understand. On top of that, it seems like Lane's father got her car back after she went missing. And according to the father, he subleased it out to somebody else. I, I was lost for words when I heard this because it seems like the whole family, before they even have any conclusion so soon, like can you imagine your father, your mother, or your brother, or whoever, your sister going missing? And then two months later, you're like, oh, let me just get rid of the furniture of my father and lease his car out because I'm having financial hardship. Like do something else to relieve your financial hardship, not get rid of your family's belongings for, for a little bit of money, extra income a month. But the podcast crew wanting to leave the evidences and the presence of Elaine until we found her, decided to pay about $1,500 a month to Susan so that they could preserve her her belongings and her room. But again, it just shows you unfortunately how disconnected it seems like the family is, even her mother and her father. Cadaver dogs were also called to search Susan's house where Elaine used to live as well. Now these dogs are specially trained to find human decomposition, even picking up scents from decades earlier. So professionals say they have about 95% accuracy. The cadaver dogs picked up something in the walls, Elaine's closet door, and a suitcase. Although this is also confusing because 
because apparently there's two signs that the dogs give. There's like a 100% certain signs and there's like an interest where they do smell something, but it's not like 100% something is there. And according to the professionals and what the podcast was talking about, they believe that the dogs picked up something in Susan's house because Susan had the belongings of Elaine's items that was inside of her car. Friends say that Elaine was a smart girl. She was also aware of everything and don't understand um, how this could have happened to Elaine. This is where we enter one crucial theory that a lot of people think that might really hold the key to what happened to Elaine. On July 27th, 2015, Elaine attends a rapper concert with some of her friends. And it seems like according to Elaine's tweets and her friends, she was actually S.A. assaulted when she went backstage at this concert. Her friends claimed that they were not there backstage, but that she was very intoxicated with a certain substance. And while she was heavily intoxicated or under the influence, she was S.A.ed. And it seems like someone also taped or have a film of this incident. Elaine tweeted about that night here on her account, which is now deleted. And according to the private investigators and one of the theories, they believe Divine was actually connected and were friends with the people who have done this to her backstage. And because this footage of what happened that night was actually going around and she found out about it, she believes that now she wanted to come forward and talk to the police. According to some of the friends, it seems like Elaine wanted to get the help or support of Divine because he somehow knew the people and that's one of the reasons why Elaine decided to meet Divine that day on January 27th. But according to the tweets, it clearly says that she will not be taking it to the authorities. But this footage apparently was going around two years later and she just could not take it anymore. This was giving her nightmares. This was something that she personally did not remember what really happened to her but was affecting her day to day and now she really wanted to potentially go to the authorities and expose these people. But this information was very hard to confirm and there's actually no proof or evidence of this. And it seems like it's something that some of the friends and people online started to potentially kind of make up in order to find an explanation. The podcast crew, when interviewing different friends of Elaine and who knew her, there was different contradicting statements and it seems like there's really no solid truth or an answer to this. According to Divine, who finally came forward and did an interview with To Live and Die in LA, he claims that he remembers her having a lot of stuff in her mind, and most of it was regarding her mother, Susan. And the whole reason why, you know, she hit him up that day and they decided to go to the movie was because, again, she was dealing with a lot of things within her family and internal stuff that he just wanted to make her feel good and just have a chill day. In the interview, he also also confirmed again that in the middle of the night she got up and dressed so fast was in a panic singing to herself and said I need to go I need to go and left. His reaction was WTF like where are you going like it's middle of the night or the morning it's so early like where are you going and she just did not say anything to him and she just left on her own. Like where would she have to go at 6 a.m. in the morning all of a sudden? I mean was she on something? Did someone call her and tell her to come somewhere? Did she just ring a bell something? Like nobody knows what was in her thoughts that day. Police looked into Divine and the theory of this case and they could not find anything. They did search his home and they did talk to Divine and they say that they cannot find anything related from him to Elaine's disappearance. When going through Elaine's computer and her backed up iCloud information from her phone and when they were looking through her past text, they found something shocking. Not from her boyfriend, not from her friends but from her own mother. Few months before she went missing, texts show Susan sending nasty, angry messages to Elaine. And some of these included, die, 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 exclamation point. You make me effing sick. And how she was messing her up in about borrowing $15 from her and like a couple money here and there. And it was always about money and just a really bad relationship between her and her mother. This explosive incident seems to be related to when Elaine and her friend got into a car crash eight months before she went missing. According to her friends, it seems like Elaine's mother was instructing Elaine to 
claim insurance money by going to the chiropractor. Although she was fine and she didn't really have injuries herself from that minor incident. According to Elaine's friends, Elaine claimed that she felt uncomfortable doing this because it felt like she was doing insurance fraud or scam because she really wasn't hurt. But her mother seemed like she really wanted to get this settlement money. The die 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 messages seems to come when Elaine decided not to go to the chiropractors and was kind of messing up the whole insurance plan and Susan got really mad and messaged her own daughter die 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 multiple times. Her friend who was in the crash remembers how Elaine just jumped out to help the other person that was hurt in the other car. While helping other people she claims that Elaine's hands was a little bit bloody and it just showed you what kind of person Elaine was. Like she other texts show that allegedly Susan got laid off from her job as well and Elaine also got laid off from her restaurant job. So neither of them seem to be working and these texts to show how they were really sensitive and arguing about every single dollar from like just a couple dollars up to a $30. This, this is really crazy because, you know, I mean, she's your own daughter. I mean, if I asked my parents for $20, $30, they would not ask me to pay it back. But according to Elaine's mother, she was so strict with Elaine because Elaine had a bad habit of spending money. So she wanted to discipline Elaine about how money is very essential to surviving and that she cannot just be spending money anywhere and everywhere. Elaine's mother claimed that she remembers how Elaine once had $800 and she just spent it the next day so that she was really careless about her spending habits. On March 31st, two months after she went missing, Susan puts a calendar reminder on her phone at 9 a.m hide it. That day at 10.30 a.m. Malibu Police Department was to come to and see her room. 1 p.m. she notes, put back, hide item, shed. People found this to be very, very suspicious, but Susan, Elaine's mother claims that this was regarding some green stuff that she found in Elaine's room, and she just was very embarrassed by it and wanted to hide it before the police came. Now, I don't think this really is significant as well, because you know, if she was really trying to hide something, why do it an hour before the police comes? Um, I'm sure it would have been done and not left any evidences on her phone or anywhere. So I don't think this is really significant or related to Elaine. Elaine's disappearance. The reward money was raised to around $250,000 for anyone who had tips and it was done through a press release and they got tons of tips but again no tips really let them anywhere and actually a lot of it was just I saw some Asian girl some psychics calling them some people just trying to claim money and like doing fraud stuff so no tip let them anywhere. The Uber driver was also tracked down that drove Divine and Elaine the day that they were coming back from the movies. And the driver claims that he noticed nothing, red flags, they were kissing, hugging, just kind of seemed like they were drunk. So nothing that really alerted him. Finally, about a year later, they were able to find a specialist that was able to unlock Elaine's phone. And the interesting thing is though, the specialist found out that her actual passcode to her phone was the numerals to Divine's street address. I just think it does tell you that Elaine and Divine actually had a deeper connection or at least to Elaine she found the relationship to be a bit more of a significance than kind of how Divine and Divine's parents kind of portrays it to be. To you guys, is this of a significance or what do you guys think? I mean, some people say that, you know, it's something that teenagers, 20 year olds, 21 year olds do. But you know, a lot of people say, come on, like what's the coincidence? The day after she meets him, she goes missing and the phone passcode is also his street address. Like I do understand, you know, the family and why they still have that question mark. Here's the phone data from January 28th. At 6.28 AM, Find My Friend app was used. And it looks like her phone sent a picture to Divine's phone of her location. This is a little confusing as back in 2017, I guess you could have kind of shared your location with those who you gave access to. But experts say that this might not have been herself, that this was more of an automatic thing that the phone sent, where both of them were most likely not aware of it on each other's phone. 
They also could not find the ping of what her phone sent to Divine. At 7.50 a.m., the Pandora music app is used, which indicates that she might have been listening to music in her car. At around 9.32 a.m., there's a notification from Pandora app that asked, are you still listening? Don't miss a second of the music you love. You know, sometimes apps or even on like smart TVs, they send a notification. If you've been running the app for too long, it says, are you still watching? Are you still listening? So I'm not sure if this notification was sent because her app was constantly running without her touching her phone. Or if this is just notification sent when you stop playing music as well and it's just and that's why it says don't miss a second of the music you love. If the app was still running on her phone and she did not touch anything physically on her phone, it seems like she possibly could have went missing or something happened to her at around 8 a.m. to 9 32 a.m. At 8.51 a.m. Susan texts Delane, now, $20, now. And this text professionals say that it seems to be unread. 10.13, 10.15 a.m. Three incoming calls from Divine. 1.10 p.m. Text from her friend Sadie, what are you doing? 1.33, 1.34, two calls from Divine, all missed. 136 to 142, Susan calls three times. Again, none of these calls seems to be picked up. No other activities of her opening her Instagram or other social media, and no other suspicious texts were found. The specialist also said that it is possible for someone to go through a phone and delete certain texts, but they would not know that through the data, or at least the phone back then, they wouldn't know. So here are some of the theories of what could have happened to Elaine, and unfortunately, we really only have theories and we don't have any physical evidence because even her phone, after being unlocked, shows no suspicious activity. Now, theory one could be that Elaine was actually hanging out with a 19-year-old kid just before she went missing, or a couple days before. And supposedly, he was, again, like just someone she was seeing. According to her friends, Elaine would kind of date random people around and he happened to be one of those guys. At one point when they were in the car together, they were stopped by the police. And this guy, the 19 year old, actually had a gun inside of his back pocket and he was arrested and there was a trial. She was supposed to testify regarding this case only a couple days after she went missing. This guy was also released from custody only two days before she went missing. According to some people, maybe this 19 year old was afraid of what Elaine was gonna say during court and he did something to her. Text message records also show how he was pretty aggressive, that he would also threaten and send a lot of messages to Elaine. According to some of the friends, they remember Elaine telling them that she didn't know what to say or, or don't wanna say anything wrong because quote, he's friends with a lot of underground rappers. The podcast crew was able to meet with this 19 year old. They did an interview also because Elaine had no knowledge about this gun. Like they don't believe that anything Elaine said would have even affected his trial. And at least as of right now, they have no evidence that he was related to Elaine's disappearance. A second theory, something that the power of investigators and Susan, her mother, believe still might be possible is that Divine had something to do with it. The private investigators claim that he looked into Divine's friends and the closest people he hangs out with are known to be in a particular gang or a group. They post very explicit things online including flashing guns, money, and a lot of criminal stuff that I cannot talk about here. Of course, as, as, as Elaine's mother or family or private investigators, this is very upsetting to find. But again, according to the police, Divine and his parents have been very cooperative. They sent the footage, they've been to their house, and they don't find anything. The next theory is that Elaine might have self-harmed herself due to her going through some depressions and you know fights with her mother. And maybe she woke up that day being intoxicated, certainly having the urge or certain feeling, and she has done something to herself. But this theory might be very highly unlikely because they found, again, no evidence of her ever wanting to hurt herself that day or even near that day. Where her car was found, there is no cliff or anywhere you could enter the waters. There's only sand and low waters and it is a very unusual way for someone to self-harm themselves. There was also a helicopter looking for any bodies 
any bodies washing up and there was nothing. And the police have ruled it that it is most likely that this is an involuntary case, meaning she did not do this to herself. The next theory is kind of like a combination of theories that it was, was a stranger, she was trafficked, she got out to maybe help someone and then they just took her. Like this was a complete stranger that knows where she is. But if this happened, there's really no evidence that they're able to go off of at all at this point. And the last theory is that she might have ran away. Again, due to her and her traumatic experiences, maybe she just decided to drop everything and go. Again, this is highly unlikely because her phone and cash was found in her car. And there is no sign of Elaine till this day. In my opinion, if this was a stranger trying to rob someone, why didn't they take her cash? Why didn't they take her phone or her laptop? Some a random person most likely, you know, at least would have taken cash or at least would have taken and turned off the phone and the laptop and you know but there was nothing taken so a lot of people believe could this really have been a stranger or was it someone that knew her and just wanted to take her and susan doesn't deny that you know she had a very tough relationship with elaine um that she didn't get love from her her father like from her friends or anybody else and that maybe that somehow contributed to her maybe being picked up by someone that and she was kind of very open to letting maybe even strangers in because she didn't feel that love because of so many suspicions elaine's mother did take a polygraph test and there was no deception found so people do not believe that elaine's mother had anything to do with elaine's disappearance and elaine's brother dustin has an explanation of why susan's behavior is so odd and it could be because susan just never really had that connection with her own daughter and because they fought all the time even violently sickly to say like she kind of had a little bit of a relief that maybe Elaine wasn't there now that she doesn't have to constantly fight and have this tension in the household. Of course, loves her daughter, but the way it's like a love and a hate relationship where she doesn't have that kind of bond and attachment that a lot of you know parents and children are supposed to have, but that does not mean that she had anything to do with her disappearance. So here is what we're really left with at the end of the day. Why did Elaine have to leave at 6 a.m. in the morning? Why was she panicky? Where did she have to go? I mean, there was no text, at least that was found in her phone that indicates that someone was calling her someone was telling her to come here or there but where does she want to go at 6 a.m in the morning susan claims that technically in the cctv you don't see elaine getting into the car by herself meaning maybe there was someone inside of her car there's still a find elaine facebook page that updates time to time and it's been five years since her disappearance and it seems like as of right now at least the people that was the closest to her before she went missing there's no evidence that relate them to her disappearance at all at this moment so it is such a mystery of what happened to her i am desperately waiting for a conclusion in this case rather she's found or what happened to her so i hope that you guys if you guys know anything or share this video share some of the links and go check it out so thank you so much for watching see you guys in my next video Today's story is one of the craziest cases to happen recently where a group of young people were accused of creating a religious organization in their secret basement. But what went on downstairs was unlike anything anyone could imagine. It left a shock not only in America, but Korea as well. This is a bizarre story that still needs to go to trial, but the preliminary hearing was held and the details are out. And yes, I watched the entire three and a half hours of the preliminary trial for you guys to condense all the information and I think it was such an important story to tell you guys because there might be more victims and potentially organizations like this out there I take a really long time to create these videos for you guys to let these informations out so if you could just hit the like button subscribing and engaging in the comments all really help on September 12th, around 10.50 p.m., Gwyneth County Police in Atlanta, Georgia, arrived at the parking lot of a Korean-style sauna spa called Jeju. Now, this area is said to have a lot of Korean communities, so it's almost like a Koreatown. The police arrived there because someone reported that there was a deceased person inside of a vehicle. Later, they would find, indeed, this was true. And they found an Asian woman that looked to be around in her 20s or 30s. 
And it did take time identifying the woman because they did find that she was not an American citizen, but was an immigrant or a tourist. The shocking thing about this case is that when she was found, she weighed only about 70 pounds and she looked visibly malnourished. So now the police have to go through the tracks. The story goes that the person who called the police was the adopted father to a 26 year old man named Eric Hyun. It is believed and later proven through CCTV that Eric was a driver of this vehicle where the deceased woman was found. And in the CCTV footages, you could see that Eric was the one driving the car, parking it at around 10 a.m. on the same day. After he parked the car, Eric actually went to the hospital for some injuries. And you could see on the CCTV visibly, he struggles to walk and we'll get into this in a bit. When Eric was getting his treatments inside of the hospital, it is still unknown what kind of injuries he exactly had, but he asked his adopted father to pick some of his belongings up from the car. So that night, the father would drive to the car and the first thing he did was open the trunk. That's when he said he smelled a really, really bad odor and decided to call the police. Now, it is unclear if Eric did this on purpose, knowing that his adoptive father was gonna find something in his car or maybe he was so shaken up, didn't care, just asked him to pick something up and forgot that this person was inside of his trunk. And police started to interrogate Eric after his hospital visit. And that's when the crazy story started to unravel and that he was part of a mysterious religious organization. Immediately, police was able to get a search warrant for a Lawrence Ville home where the crime took place. Now, this was not Eric's home, but it is believed that Eric did spend quite a bit of time there, even living there at one point. This home is very big. It is actually in a pretty nice town. I mean, I call this a pretty luxurious town where this home was located. Now, there was a family living inside of this home, 54-year-old woman Mihi her husband, and three of their kids living inside. These are the photos of inside of the house. It looks pretty normal. It looks really nice until you get to the basement. They found that there was like a mini church or a service area that they built. So this is the basement and it is split down in half, one part being like a room and the other part being like a mini church inside. When police got to the basement, they say that they heard loud Korean worship music being played repeatedly. I just thought that was a little creepy. <laughs> there were obvious signs of a cleanup with a strong smell of cleaning supplies such as bleach, Febreze, chemicals, and they report that the carpet was wet like it was recently cleaned. Chairs also had multiple punctures for some reason, and police say that they later were able to smell strong smell of decomposition after the Febreze and the chemicals odor went away. There were firearms found inside of the home, including in the garbage can, there were blood stains in the cardboard boxes, tissues, duct tapes, and pajama pants that seemed to belong to the victim. It was enough evidence for the police to arrest the people that were living inside of the home as well, minus the father. He has not been arrested yet. And here are the alleged suspects, Eric Hyun, the man who was driving the car and went to the hospital, 26 year old. Kawam Lee, also 26. Chunho David Lee, 26 years old, Chun Hyum Isaac Lee, 22, Hyunji Lee, 25, and a juvenile that was part of the family. He was the youngest one inside of the house, 15 years old. And again, the mother, 54, she was arrested as well. So Isaac, David, and the juvenile are three brothers. Kawam is believed to be the cousin of the three brothers, and Hyunji was the girlfriend of Isaac Lee. All of them minus Eric, lived inside of this house. And people seem to be shocked after seeing these photos because, you know, especially people in Korea, they couldn't believe that they were Korean people where the police were accusing them of being a gang. It took some time, but they were able to identify the victim. And she was a 33 year old Korean citizen woman named Se Hee Cho. It seemed like Mihi, the mother of the house, she and Se Hee, the victim's mother, seemed to be friends since they were young. So they were not strangers. They knew each other from 
Korea. So far, it is known that Sehi herself apparently went through some kind of sadness in her life. Now, people believe that she might have gone through S assault or something that made her go into the sadness and really rely on prayers and religion. And Sehi and her mother both were religious as well. That's how they got to also know Mihi. Prior to arriving to America, they wanted to go in some kind of a religious fast. This was going to help them get closer to God and Mihi invited them over to America to be part of their church. Now both of them were only supposed to do about three days of fasting and prayers but Sehi wanted to go through with some kind of a 40-day fasting prayer. Now of course the mother she said that she had some work she had to go back to Korea so Sehi stayed at Mihi's house while the mother went back to America. Now I do have to also note that I found that before Sehi and her mother came to America ever since January, like a couple months back, there were messages coming back and forth from David and Sehi's mother. And David's trying to somehow convince Sehi's mother that Sehi really needed this prayer session with them, that she needed to come to America to study, be there with them, be part of this church. So it seems like David wanted to recruit Sehi from months prior to her arriving to America. But she was to stay at Mihi's home, this house of horror, and pretty much study there and have a new life in America with them. It is also reported that Sehi did not have any money when she came. And apparently Sehi's mother was to compensate them later for her food, her stay, transportation, things like that. About $5,000 Sehi's mother was to compensate them. Now in the beginning, Sehi's mother says that she did have contact with the family, obviously because they've known each other for a while. But eventually after she left, a couple days later, family would stop responding to her. And this is when we're gonna go into the details of what happened. A soldiers of Christ, this is what they call themselves, this group, was apparently started by David only in January of this year. And the father of this house is a pastor and he owns another church somewhere in Georgia. We found videos of David in 2019 talking at a church and he says some bizarre stuff. In his speech, he's saying that he's able to see demon spirits and he could pray to stop rain and kind of manipulate the weather. And when he started the SOC group, one of the things that people had to go through was like a military training. And he would train military style starting from his own brothers. And one of the most important tasks that this SOC group had to do was pray for six hours a day. So victim Sehi now was alone inside of this house. Her mother left and that's when the training began to start. According to one of the members, once this orientation process initiation starts, there is no going back. Now in the orientations, apparently she was shown what she had to do, which included intense fasting, military style training, which was exhausting exercises that they had to do, strict postures that they had to do, like how to stand, how to sit, praying six hours a day, chores. Also, you can only use the bathroom two times a day. And if you had to go more than that, they were to give you a bucket and you were strictly monitored. If you do not follow these rules, you would go through again, Punishments. Phone text messages from the suspects show that they called Sehi the victim number five. So they called them by numbers. And the messages also showed conversations between David and other members of SOC. And he claimed that the victim was possessed by the devil. And that's why she had to go through a very, very intense initiation. Messages also farther showed that during the orientation, apparently she ran upstairs in her underwear and asked the father, the pastor of the house, that she wanted to leave and stop the orientation. So it seems like from what we gather that she already was going through some kind of punishment. That she had to run upstairs in her underwear to say, stop, I don't want to go through this. The messages also show that the victim tried to contact someone on her end of the phone to try and get help because, quote, it says that she was held against her will and wanted this person to call the police and even sent this person her address and where she was. 
was. Now police are still looking into who she contacted, who this person is, why the help didn't come, was she able to message this person fully or not, that's unsure. But remember, this is a Korean woman, she probably doesn't speak English, she doesn't know exactly where she is, she doesn't know how to get transportation, she has no money, and she claimed herself that she was taken against her will. The text messages also showed and proved that the victim tried to escape multiple times, and this apparently caused a fight between Isaac, one of the sons, and the father, the pastor. We don't know what happened to this fight, or if the father really tried to stop this orientation, or if he knew what was going on exactly or not. And here's the proof of what happened to her, because this was all documented in the SOC members' phone, videos, photos, and their video camera. Alleged felony murder against the juvenile. Based on what? He admitted to taking, um, partaking in the um, recruitment process, as well as some of the, which included some of the physical beatings and tasks. Um, and all of these actions while committing the felony of false imprisonment led to the death of Sihee Cho. In one video, Carter said. She was standing on her head halfway. She was being whipped with what appeared to be a belt. Carter said the woman, 33-year-old Sehee Cho, had just moved here from Korea on July 21st on a religious quest, seeking a better life that she thought she would find with soldiers of Christ. And the suspects withheld food from her. Again, police say that she looked visibly very weak. And some other crazy details and some more to come. And you guys could actually watch the full preliminary hearings down in the description box, I'll link it. And eventually, they even found photos and videos of the victim passed away inside of their basement. Again, this was proof that somebody knew that she was deceased. And she was wearing that same pajama pants that they found in the garbage can. The basement windows was also covered by newspaper. It also indicated that they wanted nobody to see what was going on inside. It seems like everybody did have some kind of a role and almost a hierarchy as well. From the phone record, it showed that the SOC members called Eric number four. And he seemed to be like the lower tier in this group, like he was made to do kind of the dirty work. A source from South Korea states that one of the reasons why Eric lived at Lee's house at one point in his life was because he did not have a great relationship with his adoptive parents. He did move back eventually. He was the one who picked her up from the airport. He was also in charge of staying with her in the basement so that she could not leave. He would also get messages from the other members and how he needed to keep her quiet in case that any guests, such as plumbers as well, were coming inside of the house and police found that mostly it was also Mihi, the mother of the house, who gave instructions to do all of this. And finally, he was also in charge of taking care of the deceased victim's body. Hanji was assigned to do chores around the house. According to some of the members, most of the members had to go through this orientation process. Kawan, the cousin, and apparently he didn't have to go through this harsh initiations because, quote, he was pure at heart heart and that's what the Lord told them. So it could be that this orientation process and the initiations maybe had to do something with them trying to get rid of people's sins and trying to cleanse them, trying to make them whole and pure again. Police are still trying to look into what the whole purpose of this SOC group was because according to the definition, a lot of the times gangs or organizations, they usually have a purpose or goal such as stealing money, stealing property, something, but it seems like according to the SOC members, when they were asked what was the purpose of this group, they could not give them a straight answer, but claimed that David was the one who received instructions from God. He was able to talk to God and the Lord. And their main task was to just listen to the word of God. And they were also in a process of trying to recruit another female member from some college, which is interesting because if it was a recruitment process, we're wondering why did they document all of this? Like photos and videos, right? And again, according to the father of the pastor, he's the only one who's not arrested in this family. And he's trying to defend his kids saying, you know, if it was something criminal that they did, why would they take photos and videos of it? And we'll get to what the defense is in a bit. But interviewing the people around them, the neighbors and friends who knew Lee's family, they were shocked that this family was so friendly, so praising of God. They had this like perfect life living in a big house in America. And some of them are in denial 
denial. They're like, I think the police are charging them with such a strict crime because like they don't understand the Korean system or that there is some kind of misunderstanding because these kids, they just cannot imagine this family doing something like this. But according to some of the neighbors that lived in that town, they say, quote, I knew who they were. They were a very standoffish family. They kept it to themselves. I would pass them on the street walking and they wouldn't even look at me. They were that kind of neighbor. So could it be that they were living a perfect two double life. Going into the autopsy, so far claimed that one of the cause of the death could be malnourishment and they did rule it as a homicide. They also cannot determine the exact date of when she might have passed, but they do believe that it could be sometime in late August. So about only a month since she arrived in America. Mihi, the mother, was the last to be arrested and during the interrogation, at first she lied to the police saying that she thought that Sehi was went back to Korea. And in the text messages, it proved that she also was the one to order the cleanup. The new twist is that Eric claimed that he was also a victim, that he was also a victim to this extreme initiation. And that could be one of the reasons why he went to the hospital due to this harsh initiation, because he was number four. According to Eric, he says that this initiation and orientation process was a very scary one and went through pretty much similar things to what the victim say he went through. Eric's defense also claimed that the Lee's family maxed out his credit card to purchase another house to build another church. He was also denied food during this initiation process and when he went to the hospital, he visibly was in a state where he couldn't walk. Although right now, of course, the prosecutors are arguing that he did partake in this. Phones show that he was ordered to take care of the body. He googled how to handle someone after passing, maintaining body temperature, and etc. Now this is going to be later argued whether he was made brainwashed to do this or not. But he was the only one out of the seven people arrested granted bail under $100,000. And he has to wear a ankle monitor and have zero contact with the Lee family. It's really crazy because Eric is said to have graduated from a very good college school. And he was loved by many people who worked with him and knew him that he was such a kind boy. And they don't know how he even got involved in this. There's a new interview with the pastor Father Lee, and he's trying to point the blame at Eric, saying that he was the only one who was left in the basement with her. They don't know what happened to her after they stopped the orientation. A new witness came forward saying that she actually went through something similar to what the victim went through in 2021. She says that she went to America to study and stay with Mihi, the Lee's family. She was made to do chores, and when she didn't do the chores correctly, she actually was made to switch her room with Eric who was living in the basement at the time. Now she had to use the basement where this mini church that they built, that's where also ironically, punishments would happen. In the preliminary hearing, this is what the alleged suspects, the defense claim. Now what it seems like they're trying to argue so far is that Sehi, the victim, she voluntarily went through this, that she was not held against her will, or at least that there's not enough evidence so far. This was her willingly wanting to give herself to the Lord. They also mentioned that the police do not have evidence of a lock, so how can she be held against her will? But the judge pointed out that you can keep someone against their will through verbal and physical threats. That doesn't have to be a physical lock to keep somebody in prison. Also, remember, Eric was the one who was ordered to stay down there with her. So who knows? Maybe you don't need a physical lock. You could have had somebody there, made them so weak, physically weak, mentally weak, that she could not physically escape anymore. The state is charging them with gang activity, which by definition, it is more than three people. They're also charged with false imprisonment, concealing a death, and some other other things. Professionals say that even though you might voluntarily join a group organization, that's kind of how cults work. They recruit you under the pretense that they're going to take care of you, where now that you're in this group so deeply that you're subject to all these things to make you believe that you are doing it for 
God or religious purpose. And also in the preliminary trials, it seems like the defense is going to argue that they were all doing this because they were hearing orders from God directly. So it's like not their fault that this was all for a religious purpose and that they had no evil intent to try and murder someone intentionally. Now, in my personal opinion, what's going on here, according to some of the other cases that I've studied, one of the possibility could be that this family has a shared psychosis disorder. Hence the reason why the mother, David, they say that they start to hear words from God and orders from God. And then now the whole family was in it and now they recruited other people and nobody in the members outside of the family as well, including Eric and Kawan, nobody called the police. And it is something that needs to be talked about. So somebody that is so deep in this, they might not think that it is criminal, that it's illegal, that it is negative, that we need to help somebody recognize that not everything in the name of God is going to help you. So hopefully this story will help other people to realize and recognize maybe some other cults or organizations or groups that are in the making or that's happening and report it to the police, knowing that this is not morally right. Remember to leave your thoughts down in the comments and to support this channel, remember to leave a thumbs up and check out today's partnership, Colin Broom. Thank you guys so much for watching. They say money can't solve all your problems, especially love. Today's case has been named as the Asian OJ Simpsons case. It was a hot topic within the community back in the 90s, a case where community didn't entirely shame the suspect for what she has done, as she might have been pushed to the edge by her husband's mistress. And did the sympathy for the suspect allow her to go free after a double murder? I'm actually generally surprised that this case has not been covered by any YouTubers, there was only one documentary on it on Oxygen. I wanted to talk about how jealousy can drive someone crazy. And if someone was purposely creating jealousy between you and your partner or your family or between your friends, creating this whole drama, I mean, what would you do? What would you do if you were pushed to the edge? I think there's a lot to learn from today's case. That's why I heavily want to talk about it. Remember, if you guys like these cases and cases that you have never heard of, just by hitting the like button, subscribing, and commenting your thoughts today all help to reach the algorithm and helps me know that I can continue making these stories. So back in the 80s and 90s in Orange County, California, there was a wealthy businessman named Jim Peng. Now Jim was Taiwanese originally and he made his fortune back in China, mainland and Taiwan and he would take his family eventually to California and start businesses over there because America really was where the big money was. But he still had his main business in Asia so he would go back from US to China and Taiwan multiple times a year. He was married to a woman named Lisa Pang and it seems like till up till the story of what happened, they've been married for about close to 20 years. They had two teenage daughters and Jim made his fortunes by creating a radio communication company and it was called Rangers Electronics Communication, which sold CB radios to police forces globally. And they said that back then in the 90s, 80s and 90s, his fortune was worth about $200 million. In today's money, that's about $450 million. So he was pretty wealthy back then. He was a multi-millionaire. He had houses, property, different businesses. So you see what kind of lifestyle he lived, especially in Orange County. Still today, that's a pretty expensive town. Lisa Pang, Jim's wife, was described to be a very determined, hardworking person. And when the couple got married, they say that Lisa actually gave up her career to become a full-time mom and to support Jim in his business. I don't know what she did prior to this, but as a woman gets married, in today's society, usually a woman still works, but she gave up her entire career and her identity of who she was, not only to become a mom, but to stand beside her man and to grow this multi-million dollar business. She saw him go from a starting company to all the way to be a multi-million dollar business. So she was there from the beginning. And of course, in return, Jim was able to provide his family with a luxury lifestyle. And pretty much this is all we know between the private life. I wish I knew more about it. And at the time of the story, Jim was about 49 years old and Lisa was 44. So they only had what, like five year difference. As I said earlier, it was normal for Jim to go back to Taiwan or mainland China to do his businesses. I mean, this is kind of what businessmen do. He might not be there for you half the time, but he's working hard, making money. But this trip in 1992, would change the entire dynamic and where we start 
this crazy story. So sometime in 1992, Jim would go back to mainland China for his work business and he would stay at this particular hotel. And at the hotel, he met a woman named Jennifer. Now Jennifer was working as a PR marketer at this hotel. And apparently this is how they met. There was some kind of performance going on inside of the hotel that the hotel was hosting. And Jim was there to watch and apparently Jennifer was standing in front of him. And because Jennifer was tall, she was blocking the views of Jim. And Jim said, excuse me, um, can you move a little bit? Cause I can't really see. And she turned around and I guess this is where Jim kind of fell in love. Jennifer was said to be a tall, young, beautiful woman. Here's a picture of her and she is beautiful. She was also also only 24 at the time and Jim was only five foot six. So if she was blocking him, she was either a little bit taller than him or the same height. I guess average height for back in the 90s for an Asian male, but still kind of maybe a little shorter for the male side. You know, having this tall, beautiful woman kind of show a little bit of interest, you know, he kind of fell right through it. So they'd start to talk a little bit as she turned around. I guess the conversation would have went down something like, oh, I'm sorry for blocking you. What are you here for? Oh, I'm the hotel PR. What can I do for you if you need anything? And he said, oh, wow, like I'm staying here for work, blah, blah, blah. And that's just how the love affair began. By the way, they have a 25 year age difference. So pretty much twice her age, Jim was. Of course, Jim had to go back to America since his work trip ended, but they would continue to see each other a couple times as he went back and forth. Now, was it really a work trip or was it an excuse by this time? We will never know. And I guess to Jim, he just couldn't stop thinking about Jennifer. I mean, think about it. Jim is a wealthy man. As a successful man, he maybe believed that he deserved this, a young, beautiful woman that he can kind of keep. You know, at least have it on the side. Maybe he has a hookup. I mean, uh, his family won't know. Like maybe he thought that this could have kind of started and ended quickly. But of course, Jennifer also knew and figured out that Jim was a wealthy man. I'm sure he flaunted his businesses and what he has done, that he's a multimillionaire. And Jennifer also quickly fell in love with Jim as well. Now, I do want to skip and mention the part that Jennifer did get pregnant by Jim. I'm not sure if this happened in China or in California when he moved her. So that's kind of unclear, but everything seems to have folded maybe a year to year and a half maximum. But either ways, whoever's idea it was, Jim decided to move Jennifer to California so that he can be closer to her and meet her more often. And this was the craziest move because now she's not just a mistress, but this is someone that you want to have a double life with. Because apparently Jim decided to fund her lifestyle in California by paying for her apartment, A, and two, by giving her a monthly allowance, and, and three, even giving her a one-third share in the company. It was a huge allowance too. She got about $5,000 a month. Could be more with all business stuff, which is $11,000 in today's money. So this was not little like allowance here and there. This was a full life funding that he was able to do. And maybe Jennifer, of course, thinking that this was almost like her lottery ticket, her meeting a multi-million dollar man and her ticket to moving all the way to America, getting out of her hotel work and being like a secret millionaire's mistress could have kind of excited her. Sounds too good to be true situation. She didn't want to let go and eventually maybe work her way up to becoming his wife. But whoever's idea started first, it doesn't matter because Jim had the power. Jim had the money. He was the one who decided to give the money to Jennifer and move him all the way next to a short distance from his family's home. So it wasn't like he was locating her to a secret location where he had to drive far. This apparently apartment that he got for her was a short distance from his family's home. Not only that, but the business that he started and decided to give one third of the share to Jennifer, uh, this new business was called J&J &J Electronics. And this was a business that sold some kind of parts for electronics, like a trading business. And it is rumored that the name of the business, J&J Electronics, could have been named after Jim and Jennifer, or G, her Chinese name. A little suspicious, a little suspicious, who knows? But if this is true that he decided to do this, he must have been so infatuated by her and she got into his head as well. If I found out my husband did this, that he was giving allowance, that he moves a mistress all the way over, that he was giving parts of his company to her and naming the company after 
the two of them, I would be livid. I'm sorry. I'm just saying if this situation happened to me in real life and I found out, I would raise hell. Reading the story as we get on, I mean, you'll see that Jim, it seemed like he really didn't care much. Like he really wasn't trying to hide anything. Like he wanted to just really have that double life and felt like he was the king, that he felt like he could do everything and have all the cakes and eat it by himself. Like just thinking about it gets someone angry and have these emotions. Think about someone actually going through it. But this is where the story gets even darker because Jim decided to even hire Jennifer to be his assistant or a staff member at his company in California. So now to get closer to her and see her more often, he decided to hire her. Now again, rather that was Jennifer's idea or his idea was mutual, it really doesn't matter. It's his company, he's the boss. He has the power to push the buttons to hire and fire anybody he wants. And this is where people believe that Jennifer really did not want to back down and did not want to be the side chick anymore. She did not want to be the mistress anymore. She wanted to be his main girl. She wanted to be the main new woman in his life. She saw what Jim had to offer and decided to kind of take the throne and now take the matter into her own hands. Now, in my opinion, I don't think that Lisa entirely knew about this until later on because I think it was normal for her to have like a business man, have a business husband that went back and forth, that was always busy building businesses. I mean, she's watched him grow for years. But Lisa started to notice some clues here and there as Jennifer moved to America. Lisa noticed that when she wasn't in her house and she came back home, she would notice female clothing inside of their closet. She would also notice female clothing inside of Jim's like travel bag and like his work bag. And she'll be like, what is this? Like whose clothing is this? It's the females. And Jim apparently just kind of shrugged it off like, oh, it's a female acquaintance. Oh, it's a female staff member at work. Maybe they accidentally put it in there or whatever. I mean, and of course, never underestimate a woman's intuition because Lisa started to suspect that Jim did have another woman or somebody was fooling around with him. So this meant that when Lisa and their kids weren't home, Jennifer would purposely come to their home. I don't know if Jim invited her. I don't know if Jennifer came there alone, but I'm sure first couple times Jim invited her and she would leave pieces of clothing in their closet for Lisa to purposely find out. But just that action alone, I'm not talking about the person, I'm just talking about that action alone, is very sinister. You're trying to get purposely a negative reaction out of someone and sending them a signal or a sign saying, hey, I'm fooling around with your man better watch out, like I might steal him. I mean, this is a very, very heartbreaking thing for a wife to find out and very, again, sinister for someone to, um, again, provoke someone to have negative emotions, jealousy and anger. So maybe purposely Jennifer wanted Lisa to find out and leave him. It was as if Jim also didn't care and also kind of wanted Lisa to maybe find out and leave herself. So after some time, of course, Lisa noticed that Jim was having an affair and she found out that it was probably someone at the office. I mean, trust me, when you have an affair at the office, like your other staff members can smell it. And of course, Lisa being the wife, maybe she questioned other staff members, other work people, you know, asking them, hey, was there something going on? And maybe someone tattletale. But at the end of the day, a wife's intuition can't be played with and she decided to go to Jim's office. That's where she met Jen Jennifer face to face and quote, had no trouble identifying the woman. Of course, Lisa being a devoted wife, she was heartbroken and decided to have a conversation with Jennifer, but the conversation did not go well because when Lisa told her, hey, leave my husband alone, Jennifer came on strong and she said no. I'm not gonna leave Jim and I love him. And not to mention, this was a woman that was a lot younger than her, so Lisa probably felt a little bit powerless. And as days went by, Jennifer did not back down. She decided to go back to their house when they weren't home, or maybe Jim invited her, we don't know, but left her clothing purposely there multiple times. And of course, Lisa would find this out. And Lisa got so angry that she would cut the clothes up that Jennifer left. I mean, I kinda don't blame her about cutting the clothes 
clothes if I saw that a woman purposely entering my own home and my bedroom and leaving their clothing as a sign of a little like teasing her and making fun of her, I would also probably rip the clothes off too. There was also an incident when Lisa went to Taiwan for her own trip and I guess she didn't tell Jim that she was coming back early or a specific date. So when she came home, she found a woman's underwear in their master bed. And later that night, she caught Jim and Jen coming to their home together and they were surprised because they did not expect to see her there. Lisa asked Jen, what are you doing here? And apparently Jen replied, don't be so sure this will be your house for too long. So Jen was not sorry or ashamed for what she was doing. Again, it seems like Jen was just doing nothing. And it was said that Lisa and Jen both had strong personalities, which might be one of the reasons why they clashed violently. I think the most hurtful thing that Lisa probably went through was the fact that when she confronted her husband, Jim, he decided to do nothing about it. Lisa demanded that he fire and break up with Jennifer, but Jim refused to do so. So he was the one in the middle, I'm sorry about causing this war, but kind of like not doing anything about it and letting everybody else do the fighting. In an article, it says that because still, being in the 90s, you know, being an Asian couple, being pretty traditional, like divorce was not an option. Now, it also could be that because Jim was so wealthy, if they did get a divorce, Lisa might get like almost half or even more of his fortune. So maybe for Jim, like divorce was not an option. And also, of course, to an Asian woman, um, divorce, getting a divorce is very taboo. You know, you are still devoted to each other. It's ride or die. You're committed to your spouse no matter what, and you're supposed to solve these problems problems and understand each other. I mean, a little small pickle move, but I think he was trying to like calm the situation on both sides by lying to them, telling Jennifer, I love you, but I can't really leave my wife. I will still support you and fund you. And to his wife, he was like, I will stop the affair. You know, just give me a little bit more time. Like, I love you, let's try to work things out. And that could have been what Jim was trying to do and trying to just buy more time. But unfortunately, what Jim was doing was digging himself a grave even farther. Experts also say that, especially back then, with a lot of these wealthy Chinese men who went to China for work back and forth, always had some kind of a mistress back in their home country and would come back to America to their family. So this wasn't uncommon. But for Jim, again, he decided to have a second life with this woman. So sometime during all of this, Again, I don't know if the pregnancy happened in China or in America, but Jennifer would get pregnant at some point. And apparently back in the 90s, Chinese couple were not allowed to have more than one kid, especially in also an extramarital affair. Having a kid, it was also illegal. So Jennifer technically couldn't stay in China. But nevertheless, Jennifer became pregnant and Jim was not too happy about this because now you've just dug yourself into a grave that you just cannot come out of. And to Jennifer, she seemed happy about it. Jennifer said that she was gonna keep the baby. Apparently in China back then, if you had an extramarital affair and had a pregnancy and you had more than one child, it meant that you had to get an abortion. There is rumors saying that maybe Jennifer really wanted to have a child because it meant that she was locking him and that if there were any fortunes that she can earn, like it goes to her child. So it meant that she was probably secure for life. We don't know exactly when Lisa, the wife found out, but this was the ultimate betrayal for her. Not only were you living a double life, but now your husband has a baby with the mistress that's been teasing you. And I think this is what really drove Lisa mad and that she decided that it was not enough to just confront them anymore, that she had to do something to just end this whole ordeal. We don't know this part, again, when she found out, but maybe it was Jennifer that told Lisa. That's something that I couldn't find. Maybe Jennifer called her up and said, hey, I'm pregnant. Or maybe again, Lisa just found out on her own. Maybe she went to the office and saw a pregnant belly of Jennifer. So fast forward to August 18th, 1993. It is said that Jim and Jennifer met in 1992. And by August, Jennifer's newborn child was five months old. So if you do the math, everything happens so quickly. So that's why I'm wondering if the pregnancy happened in China or America or when they came to America is unclear. So on August 18th, when Jim came back from his business trip, he decided to go and check up on Jennifer and the baby. When he went to the apartment, he knocked and nobody opened the door. He thought that maybe they went for a stroll, came back a couple hours later and still no one was answering. And the doors were always locked, but this time he decided to pivot the doorknob and it opened. When he went in, he saw something 
that was traumatizing, which was Jennifer's lifeless body. Of course, he called the police, and police actually found that their five-month-old child also died. And this is when Jim found this out, so he did not discover the baby until later on. Whatever happened between this drama, at the end of the day, seeing your child and someone that you cared about lifeless could have really damaged him pretty badly. So of course, at first, Orange County police thought that Jim had to be the potential first suspect because they quickly found out that he had a whole nother life. He, had, he was married, he had kids, and this was his mistress, but he was able to prove that he went on a business trip until August 18th and he was cleared as a suspect. The forensic evidence showed that Jennifer had to open the door to somebody. It meant that it could have been someone that she knew and she willingly opened the door for. Autopsy showed that she was stabbed 18 times while her child was suffocated with a blanket. They also found DNA of a bite mark in one of her arms. This is when police suspected that Jim's wife, Elisa, could have been involved. But when she was interrogated, she strongly denied it. She did have to give her DNA, and the DNA of the bite mark actually matched Lisa's DNA, so police already knew that she had to be the suspect, but Lisa still was denying it completely. Although at this point, Jim actually felt pretty guilty for what he has done, and actually stood by the side of Lisa. Like, he told the police he doesn't think his wife did it. Police was about to arrest Lisa. This this is when police talked to Jim and asked him, hey, can you talk to your wife in private? Now, apparently they had a calm conversation in the police station and they talked in Chinese and it said, quote, on the audio, Jim and Lisa could be heard arguing over the death with Lisa blaming his infidelity for it all. Jim questioned Lisa, why did you murder her? Why did you stab her? Lisa stated that Jennifer slipped on the knife in self-defense. She also said that she did go over to Jennifer's house and they actually had a fight. So my guess is that something had to happen to provoke Lisa to the point where there was no returning. Maybe she found out about the baby after it was born. Maybe Jennifer called her. Whatever it was, it provoked Lisa to the point where she went over to Jennifer's house. Now, why the child though? So experts believe that to Lisa could not just get rid of the other woman, but anything that reminded her of Jim's affair. And maybe anytime she saw the child or thought about it would have reminded her of the heartbreak over and over again, and she could not handle that. Police thought that this was damning evidence in a confession, and they did arrest Lisa. And surprisingly, the Asian community or people who knew about the story supported Lisa. As the media portrayed Lisa as a poor woman abandoned by her husband, and Jennifer was portrayed in the media as this gold digger, someone that wanted a rich man to live in the USA. Having a child meant that she can gain his wealth. But speaking for Jennifer, I mean, she was so young. She was only 24, 25 years old. And I'm thinking that Jim probably also manipulated Jennifer saying, hey, I can take care of you. Like I can be your man, like we can have this whole life together. And Jennifer probably thought, okay, like she fell into that. She was probably promised this whole life and whole luxurious life of being taken care of new life in America. So after the court hearings, the first case resulted in a hung jury. So I believe a hung jury is when you do not have an unanimous vote. So some people said she's innocent. Some people said she's guilty. In murder cases, it has to be a unanimous vote or at least a majority vote that she's guilty. And apparently Jim actually decided to not testify against his wife. I guess out of guilt, he just couldn't do it. He was in a weird middle position like he always was. He couldn't stand up for his mistress that was murdered. And at the same time, couldn't testify against the murderer, which was his own wife. And guess what? Jim did not only not testify during court, but during the whole court case, he was in Taiwan and never came back to the US once. And Lisa's defense team actually blamed Jim, saying that he was a murderer and that the murder could have happened on August 18th when he came back. And I think everybody knew that this was untrue, that it had to be Lisa. And during the second trial, the jury found Lisa guilty and sentenced her to life. She did appeal and in October 1999, her appeal went through because she was actually not informed of her constitutional rights when she was arrested and also that she was tricked into talking 
to her husband and it was like a tricked confession. So all of these actually allowed Lisa to get another trial. Now in an article published back then, it states that people do think that sympathy did get to the jurors. They did see that Lisa was really pushed to her limits and all this heartache drove her to unfortunately make her crazy. And in this case, the prosecution had to offer Lisa a plea bargain. And her plea deal was that she would plead guilty to the two charges of voluntary manslaughter and serve 11 years, then be deported back to her country and never be able to return to the USA. I'm not sure if Lisa premeditated this murder or it kind of happened when she went to go confront Jennifer and she got so angry that this happened. We really will never know. So I believe she was credited for the prison time that she was in until the last and final trials. So minus that, after she served her terms, she was deported back to her country. And today in 2023, she should be in about 70s. And there's no whereabouts, there's no update on what happened to Lisa after that. Jim says, I caused everything. I have nowhere to go in Taiwan, US or China because the story blew up in the Asian community even back in his home country. For Jim, of course, people showed no sympathy. They knew that Jim was the one who caused all of this and that he was a traitor and a fool to bring mistress all the way and conducted this affair in such an open manner that he did not man up to stop this at any point. An attorney said, quote, you're forced to take sides. It's not really a legal issue, it's a moral issue. We do not really spend a lot of time talking about who is the murderer. We're talking about who's at fault, the husband, the wife, or the mistress. Through a research, I also found out that in 1997, Jim and his company was sued by the US court for illegally importing radio equipment. Jennifer's parents also sued Jim for $2 million, quote, claiming he should have known a violent confrontations would arise between the two and failed to provide Jen and the baby adequate security. And of course, Jennifer's parents were devastated at the results of the plea bargain and having a hung jury. They believe that Lisa was the evil woman that could not control her angers and have murdered not only their daughter, but the innocent child. We don't know what happened to this lawsuit, but do you think that Jim knew? Do you think that Jim knew that Lisa was going to have this violent confrontation with Jennifer? Should he have known? Did he not care? There are some people who might argue, hey, Jim is a wealthy man. He built all this up. Like he should allow to live his life, even having affairs because, you know, I mean, they say that men, especially back in the days as kings, they had multiple concubines, multiple mistresses. But I say, you know, we live in such a different time. There's a reason why why murder, rape, um, affairs, even actually until recently in Asia, countries like Korea, extramarital affairs was illegal. You can actually sue someone for it and go to jail for it. Yes, it was overturned and that law is no longer there in South Korea, but it is still in place in many other countries. And there's many things that we as humans want to do in a way that's kind of like the primitiveness of a human being. But using that primitive thing as an excuse in 2023, I don't know if that sounds kind of fair. Unfortunately, we're not like insects or mammals like lions and elephants, chickens, you know, where, you know, they don't have these emotions. They don't have jealousy if the male lion goes and makes different babies with different, you know, female lion. But there's a reason why humans do. There's a reason why we have these emotions and why we do get angry and figure out well, what does it mean to betray someone? What does it mean to hurt someone? Would it have been better for Jim to have opened up and had a conversation with Lisa? Would she not have understood no matter what? Now, at the end of the day, I still think it is not right what Lisa did at all. And I personally don't know if I would use the word jealousy when it came to Lisa. I think she was more provoked. Jim wasn't budgeting. Jennifer wasn't budgeting. I mean, what did Lisa have an option to do other than try to resolve this in her own manner, in her own ways? Again, definitely do not agree or condone anything that Lisa did. But I do think this is the part where a lot of people felt sympathy for Lisa. And at the end of the day, I would wish Jennifer was here to tell her side of the story because she's not here to tell her side of the story at the end of the day. My heart does go out to the child that innocently died and was brought to this world. And I think there's also a lot to unpack in this story. Because maybe you that are watching went through a cheating spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend that drove you crazy. You don't know what they're doing when they're not next to you and you just start to stalk them because you can't trust them. And once that trust is broken, I don't know 
it'll be able to be fixed. Let me know what you guys have thought about today's story in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys in my next video. What would you do in the name of love? A perfect family, attending church every week, even adopting kids from another country to give them a better life, beautiful house, and perfect jobs. What could go wrong and what would drive the most perfect good person to become a monster without ever being detected for so long? Or was that person's definition of love twisted all along? And I would love your opinion of why people do this, why certain parents, families, and neither their entire families out of the name of love. If you love these cases and the true crime and mysterious world and how we can spread these cases that has been forgotten so that doesn't happen in the future, remember to hit the like button, subscribing, leaving a comment all really also helped with the algorithm because algorithm has been hard on my channel in the past two months so that I can continue creating these videos and sharing these cases with you guys. So an all-American family once lived in a very nice town in Iowa City, Iowa. A man named Steven Sopel was born in 1965, and I believe he was a sixth child of eight sibling household that he grew up in. He graduated the University of Northern Iowa School in 1983 with a business degree. Steven himself seemed like he had a pretty normal life. During his early days when he was young, he did a lot of different side jobs like bartending, lifeguarding, he loved watching football, playing golf, and doing different kind of sports. And his close friends described him as someone who was humorous, like a clown, and said people wanted to be around him because he was like the funny guy out of your, all of your friends. One of his best friends described Steven as a loyal friend. He remembers going through a very tough time with like a death in the family, and Steven even skipped school or work for him, for his friends, to spend time with him. So they see this guy as such a fun, loyal, good hearted man. In 1985, at a bar in Iowa, Stephen would meet his wife, Cheryl. They were dancing at the bar and found each other, and friends described them as the couple that was always together. Cheryl was described as a very smart, strong woman. She graduated with an education degree because she loved kids and teaching. That's something that she would pursue later as she got older. She became a teacher at elementary schools in Iowa. Cheryl was described to be very active. She attended many book clubs, study groups, women's groups, Bible study groups, and the couple would actually attend church together every single week. Stephen and Cheryl got married on June 13th, 1990, and they have been now, fast forward up to 2008, together for almost 18 plus years if you're including the dating stages. And it was as if they were soulmates and were just meant for each other. Now Stephen went on to become an executive of a banker and a trust company while Cheryl was a teacher. Now it seems like of course, the couple really wanted kids, but I guess there was some kind of fertility issues or some reasoning that the couple together couldn't have biological kids. So of course, the next thing that they thought of and wanted to do was to adopt kids. I'm not sure exact date of when each of the kids were adopted, but up till 2008, Cheryl and Steven would adopt four kids from South Korea, adopting them one at a time. It's a lot of kids, four kids, not gonna lie, that's a lot, and they all decided to adopt them from South Korea. I'm not sure of the reasoning, but it seemed very beautiful. I mean, before adopting them, you know, going through the process, family friends say that Cheryl and Steven would hold around photos of the kids that they were going to adopt. They were so excited to have addition to their family, and they were already living in a neighborhood that was really great to raise kids. They had a beautiful house. They had good jobs themselves. And again, family friends describing them as so elated to be adopting kids. Now, introducing the kids that they've adopted, Ethan was the oldest and the first son that they adopted. Ethan was born in 1997 and described as the smartest one, had good social skills and very mature for his age. And by 2008, when the incident happened, he was 10 years old. He was in the fourth grade. He did activities such as playing the cello, going fishing with his dad, adopted dad, Stephen, playing soccer. And it seemed like Stephen was very involved in the kids' activities. The second youngest one is Seth, born in 1999, described as an animal lover. 
a bit shy but adventurous yet sensitive and loved nature like gardens and flowers third was mira who was born in 2002 she was the entertainer of the family she was not shy she had so much energy and always had something to show a family friends even say that they remember her learning magic tricks to show their families during christmas then the last and the youngest eleanor she was born in 2004, only three and a half years old at the time. And friends describe Eleanor as the one who was really attached to her father, Stephen, and was together all the time. It seemed like she loved her adopted dad a lot. And again, family friends describing supple family once they had all four children as, quote, such a good family. They seem to be really loved. Supple family welcomed four children adopted from South Korea to this home over the years. One friend says Cheryl Supel gave up a full-time teaching job to stay at home after the second adoption, and it showed in her love of kids. She was, um, she, she was very creative and very thoughtful. She loved to read. Um, we were members of the same book club. In fact, she organized it, and um, she was very involved at the Iowa Children's Museum. The kids were also very close to their grandparents of Stephen and Cheryl, and they all lived in a similar town. They had grandparents, they went to church, they, they were doing a lot of hobbies and activities. They were out there in the neighborhood, like everybody knew them. I'm not sure why, again, they decided to adopt so many kids for, but obviously it's their choice, and it's a beautiful thing to want to give these kids a second chance. Come from South Korea having no parents and going to a America to learn English, live in a beautiful place and getting to learn all these activities. It's like a dream for anybody. And I found more information of what the neighbors described the supple family. They described them as having good routine. And Cheryl always described Stephen, her husband, as a good man good husband and a good father. Fast forward, Stephen was working at the bank in the trust company for about seven years now. Now fast forward to 2007, Stephen was actually fired from his company because they found out that Stephen was stealing from the bank. To be exact, he was accused of stealing over half a million dollars within the seven years he's been working there. And he was cashing in the company's funds and money into his personal accounts. I guess little by little within the seven years. As Stephen was fired on October 3rd, 2007, soon the company would file charges against him. And during the investigation, which took only a few months, Stephen did confess to the investigators that he did take the money. Steve Supel has been in the news recently for his alleged involvement in a bank embezzlement case. Prosecutors say that Supel embezzled more than $550,000 during the seven-year period that he worked at Hills Bank and Trust. He pleaded not guilty to embezzlement and money laundering charges just last month and was out on bond awaiting trial in April. And this is where the story gets weird and odd. Again, with everything I described about Steven, we're not trying to figure out this other side of Steven. So Steven confessed to the investigators that yes, he did take the money. And when asked why, he gave a bizarre answer that was just not like him. He said that, quote, he needed money to fuel his drug addiction and gambling addiction. But when investigators looked into his lifestyle and his banking history and everything, like they found no evidence that he did drugs or was addicted to gambling at all. Why did he have to give this excuse that he was a druggie or that he had to do gambling, right? And it is still unknown exactly where the money went, but it seems like the investigators and family believe that he was using this money just to fund his lifestyle with his kids and his family. In one article, it says that they didn't have a super luxurious life, but not poor either. They called it a comfortable lifestyle. So it's not like they did anything extravagant, but again, they were living in a pretty nice town, a nice house, and it seems like Steven did take out more mortgage for his house for $244,000 and did have some debt as well. I mean, I'm thinking Stephen was getting paid a salary, right? It's not like they weren't getting paid anything. Four kids, I mean, six people in total, that is a lot. But I mean, I guess the money that he stole and deposited and used is still a lot of money to spend within seven years. I mean, it's not like they were living in million dollar houses or buying like luxury goods, at least according 
according to the police. So where was that money actually going just to fund their comfortable lifestyle? Um, have this perfect image on the outside? Who knows, right? That's the mystery here. Or was Steven really doing gambling and drugs and nobody knew about it and there's just no evidence he was just so good at hiding it? And people do wonder, well, did Steven have a side to him that he just told nobody? Was he struggling mentally and physically and going through something that nobody could understand and he couldn't open up to anybody? You know, did all of a sudden having four kids and having to fund, you know, six people in his family give him such a pressure that something just started to kind of tweak in his brain and he felt like, he had to keep up with something that he couldn't. Did he take on more than he can handle? Then he kind of regretted adopting these four kids. Did Steven and Cheryl, you know, fight all the time within the house, but you know, nobody knew about it or Cheryl never talked about it with anybody else? Were they both involved or was it just Steven himself like getting inside of his head? But even through the financial and legal difficulties, of course, it's so difficult to know that your husband that's supposed to be supporting this whole family might be in jail. A friend say that Cheryl was taking it very positively. She was waking up 5 a.m. in the morning, going to the gym, him, you know, changing her appearance, working really hard for her mental and physical health, coming home at 7 a.m. and getting the kids ready for school. And even after Steven got fired, Cheryl decided to take on the responsibilities, even getting a job to again support their family. I'm not gonna lie, this is a scary thing. I've been through lawsuits before, I've been through, you know, I've talked to the police and things like that. So it can be a very scary time. And like my mental health, you guys, when you know I was going through lawsuits myself, it was very very hard and difficult so imagine this family having the fbi involved and you're getting investigated on top of that if found guilty which there was overwhelming evidence i mean he was indicted in february of 2008 and he did post a bill of two hundred fifty thousand dollars and his trial was set to start on april 21st if he was found guilty apparently according to an article the maximum that he would be serving is 30 years but some say that the minimum he he would be put into prison is about three to five years. We would never know how that trial would have ended up with a bail of $250,000. So again, almost with everything combined, about a million dollars that he might have to owe or try to earn somehow. And on top of that, going to prison for unknown amount of years, that's very scary. Of course, it's something that Steven did to himself, but so could it be that Steven just saw a no way out? He felt the pressure of, of not being able to provide for the four kids that he decided to take on as his responsibility and his wife of 18 years and that perfect American family image that he had. Was it too much for him to watch that all fall down? Now, it was unclear of what exactly happened within the family, the vibe and the energy of what happened inside the house when no family and friends were obviously watching. On the morning of March 23rd, which was a Sunday, the family would attend Easter mass at their Catholic church. They met their friends and family, including the grandparents, and none of them say that they saw anything odd. When the family friend was stopped by at the supple family house and says that he saw one of the children and again, didn't notice anything odd. Members of the Supel and Kesterson families released a statement together today. They say they were with Steve Sherrill and the children during the Easter weekend, and they saw nothing unusual. They also said in part that they've tried to remain alert for signs of particular stress, especially during the past few difficult months for the family. 11.30 p.m., Stephen leaves a message for his father and brother at his old law firm phone. So he literally left a voice message at his old company's law firm. I guess it was like an answering machine that they had and he would leave a message there, which is crazy because he was fired, he quit. Why would he leave a message at his old law firm? But again, that could connect to why Steven did the things that he did. And in the message he said his family was in heaven. Police do believe that by this time, Cheryl, his wife, might have passed, but his family, his kids, were still alive. Later, we would find that Cheryl was found with blunt force trauma. Most likely, Stephen used a weapon. Then, 11.30 p.m. to 3.45 a.m. on Monday, Sometime between then, according to Steven's confession note that he left that police later found at their kitchen table, he claims that he tried to gather the children in the family van, which was parked inside of their garage. 
and try to end everyone, including himself, using carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, for whatever reason, Stephen says that this didn't work, and he ushered the kids back inside of the house. We don't know exactly the time frame of how this happened. We only know from what we found in the forensic evidence, but it is believed that Stephen, one by one, most likely had ended the lives of the four young Korean kids with his baseball bat. The three oldest children were found in their bedroom, while the youngest was found downstairs in the toy room. We don't know the details of how it happened. Did he gather everyone up? Did the kids see this coming? Did he have them brainwashed to agree to do this? Or were they just playing with their toys and something happened? Did each of them obviously watch their brothers and sisters be murdered by their own loving, supposedly loving father? Did they watch the mother happened i mean we don't know the details and it's just leaving it up to our imaginations but at the end of the day i think we can see kind of what could have happened and there was no way these children were not terrified that they were not scared and they knew exactly what was about to happen to them then steven went on to do even more bizarre things at 3 45 a.m steven leaves another message at his old office and i believe he left a message at his former employer we don't know what steven said to this former employer was he cursing this person out was he saying sorry we don't know 3 50 a.m steven leaves a message at his house expressing regrets of course everybody in the house was passed and he was leaving a message at his own house voice machine that's crazy 4 1 a.m he leaves another message at his house saying that he tried to drown himself at the river but didn't work and he just kept floating so he was literally calling leaving voice message saying what he was doing what he was about to do it was like leaving a diary or traces of his thoughts i, I, I think that's just really crazy and interesting to see why he was doing the things he was doing. Was he low-key expecting somebody to save him? That's why he was leaving these voice messages. 6.31 a.m. Steven finally calls 911. And here's the voice recordings. Hey, location of your emergency. Hello? Am I talking to Iris? Yes, this is Iris. Can you hear me? No, this is... Where, what is the location of your emergency? Iowa City, Iowa. What's the address, ma'am? 629 Barrington Road. Please go there immediately. What's going on there? Finally, at 6.36 a.m., Steven is said to have deliberately crashed his van in the interstate, driving at a high speed, crashing into a concrete pillar, and Steven was found deceased. This news has shocked the town, the family, and friends. This, again, perfect couple that decided to do something so loving and kind of adopting four kids from another country and doing this not to himself, but to innocent lives, his own kids why did you adopt these kids innocent kids of course i'm not saying that steven or cheryl knew that they were going to do this when they adopted the kids but still again this is why a lot of people think that something within steven snapped rather than him pre-planning this for years right i mean according to the confession letter that was found which was not released to the public only family and friends were able to read it steven expressed that apparently this was one of the only ways out that he had to do this this was the best thing that he could do for his his own family again twisted love i think the hardest thing to fathom is what the kids were going through were they trying to protect each other again did they know that this was coming the last moments being to seeing their protector and someone that they were supposed to love and be loved turn into a monster against their will it's just ooh, that's that's, that's hard Again, they found a four-letter handwritten note by Stephen. But those who read it says that it was an apologetic letter with details of what he did in the last moments to his family, indicating that one of the main reasons of why he did this to his family was most likely due to the money in the trial. It's hard to imagine, but there are people who believe that, you know, if something happens to them, if their life is over, like they have to take the entire family with them. It's as if they don't see themselves separated from the family that they are in one whole it's either we all go down or we don't funeral was held for the entire family and actually the next day march 24th would have been their third child mira's sixth 
birthday. And according to the family's wishes, the entire family, the four kids, Cheryl and Stephen, were all buried next to each other. Again, it's not my decision to criticize the family, but Supple's relative and family say that, quote, this is what they would have wanted to be buried next to each other. Adoption Center in South Korea also say that they had no idea, obviously, this was to happen or notice any unusual things about the supple couple before adopting the kids. One of the biggest mystery again to me is why Steven had to steal the money. What was he using this for? So what made Steven, this good father, good man, steal in the first place and think that he could get away with it? And why did he do this for so long? Did he really need over half a million dollars to keep up with this family image? Children are expensive, but did he spend all that money on the children's hobby? Did, was his salary not enough? Was this something that Cheryl, you know, couldn't have worked through? Maybe he felt bad asking Cheryl to work a little more to support the family. Did they not want to go to a smaller house? You know, there could have been many things done, but it wasn't done. Again, was it something that snapped that day or the day before where Steven decided to do this in his own head? Was it something that was pre-planned for a long time? Did Steven go through some mental problems that we did not know about and he talked to nobody about? It's truly a mystery and it's really sad that we will never get to know the exact truth. So what do you think was going on in Steven's head? Why he did this? And do you think Cheryl was also involved? Do you think that something happened within the family that nobody saw? Maybe, you know, Steven was really mean to the kids when nobody else was around. Who knows what really happens behind closed doors? I personally believe that, you know, for majority of the people that there are certain signs that you could have seen years before or some things that Steven did behind, again, closed doors that could have been a sign just happens to not have been detected by a lot of people. How can we prevent this in the future is the most important question and thing that we have to talk about. See you guys in my next video. Fleeting moments, you catch a glimpse of an Asian male disappearing beyond a sea of Asian faces. Enough time for a positive identification? Or not. Choi Soo Lee's wrongful conviction has been one of the biggest cases to happen in America. One of the saddest stories of a young immigrant who was pushed around by the broken justice system back when a lone minority like him was unheard and seen completely thrown away like trash. His story is so important to be remembered, making sure everybody deserves a chance to be heard, especially when accused for something you didn't do. There is a whole amazing documentary called Free Tarsu Lee, I watched it. It brought me to tears of what this man has gone through and I knew that I had to talk about it because it seems like this case did happen a while back and although it was big back then, of course, people forget about it. Back in the times when a face like Tarsu Lee didn't matter. What this man has gone through is one of the craziest stories that I've ever heard of and unfortunately, I don't want to say this, but it seems like every unlucky thing that you can have done to your life has happened to this man and it seems like my problems are literally nothing Thing compared to what this man has gone through and why cross-racial identification is so important in the justice system, especially when identifying a suspect. And we're going to be getting into what that is. I'm going to take you guys back all the way to the 70s in San Francisco, Chinatown. Now, back in the days, it wasn't just Chinatown, but it seems like a lot of neighborhoods across America and honestly, any countries back then, there seemed to be a lot of gang violence that went on, especially in the broad daylight, especially places like Chinatown where it was like mostly recently immigrated heavy town. And among the many immigrants, a man named Char Su Li was one of them. Although he lived in Chinatown, he was not Chinese. He was born in South Korea on August 15th, 1952 and would immigrate to the United States when he was 12. Now, ironically, actually August 15th is Korean Independence Day from the Japanese colonial. And it seems like a lot of Koreans when talking about Char Su Li say that being born on August 15th, you're carrying a lot of the sadness, almost the entire sadness of what South Korea had to go through. Now, being born during the Korean War, which ended in 1953, his family, his entire relatives, his, the entire country of South Korea went through 
heavy, heavy poverty. A country that has just been through a war, you're literally scrapping for food. Everything is destroyed by bombs and guns and, and a lot of deceased people on the streets. My grandma tells me how it used to be back then. It was not pretty. It was said that Char Su Lee was born out of a wedlock. So his mother was actually R as assaulted by his father. Back then, especially in like Asian countries, you were shamed. A lot of people could not talk about it. There was no support from your family being like, oh, it's okay, like let's get therapy. There was no therapy. People disowned you. Like you were seen as dirty, but it wasn't even your fault. I know it was horrible back then. And because of that, it seems like Lee's mother went through a very tough time on her own as well. She says that she didn't get much support from her own family, minus her sister. It seemed like Lee's mother just wanted a different life, a better life for herself and her family. So she actually met a US soldier and got married in America. So she went there to kind of settle on her own first while Lee was staying with his aunt and uncle back in South Korea. When Lee was 12, his mother would come back to South Korea and bring Lee to move to the US. And this is when it seems like all trouble seemed to break loose for Lee. Now it's really interesting in the documentary, Lee's mother talks about her taemong. Taemong means pregnancy dream in South Korea and this has a big meaning to Asians. I'm pretty sure like all countries have something like this. And this pregnancy dream is supposed to predict your baby's destiny in this life. Usually these vivid pregnancy dreams are supposed to be positive. I remember my mom telling me that she says that she walked up and there was this sunflower that was full of seeds, like very, very, very full. And that seems like a positive dream. When she talked about my brother's pregnancy dream, he was like this big whale inside of this pond or something. So usually these dreams are said to be positive, but for Lee's mother, she said her dream was about a snake that was chasing her and it bit her. She was trying to get away from it and kill it, but the snake didn't die and it just kept Biting her. So if you do believe in the whole dreams and spirituality, I just thought that that was really crazy and how you might think that dream coincided and what that meant for Lee and his life and his destiny. So when Lee arrived in America at the age of 12, he says that that's when he was, he just became a rebellious boy. He didn't understand English and 12 is like a very sensitive age because you're like about to be a teenager and you didn't come when you were super young at like five years old when you're kind of forgetting about everything. And he says that he was admitted to a school that was Chinese predominant students. Actually, he was one of the only Koreans in the school. So there was not much Korean immigrants, at least in this town back then. Not speaking English fluently, he says that one Chinese student picked on him and they started a fight. They went to the principal's office. Principal apparently was taking the side of the Chinese student. And Lee says that he got so angry and he couldn't express himself because he didn't speak English well enough and started to literally kick the principal. Principal then called the police and tried to charge Lee with assault or battery. And Lee was admitted to juvenile because of this. He was sent to in and out of institutions and eventually even being admitted to psychiatric ward because he wouldn't talk. Now later, Lee says that this was because simply he couldn't speak English and because he felt so alone being the only Korean. It was a big misunderstanding. He wasn't insane. And actually three months into the psychiatric ward, he was declared sane. And it was all because again, he didn't speak speak English. And I guess back in the 60s of America, you don't have a lot of understanding about other people, especially immigrants who didn't speak English. It was more like, what is wrong with you? Why, did, why, why is this little boy throwing a tantrum? I don't understand what he's saying. Just put him into an institution. A juvenile. They still had a lot better life than in South Korea because they had running water, they had a stove inside of the house, it was warm, they had a bath. Ali says that every chance that his mother had with him, she would beat him. And it got so bad that Lee would just run away from home. And now later, we would find out why Lee's mother has done this and she would confess to a friend that because Lee was born out of wedlock and being R, Lee's mother low-key hated her son. She says that every time she looked at him, it reminded her of that trauma. It must have been difficult for her and messed with her mind, but at the same time, Lee was an innocent child himself and he needed the positive guidance and nobody was helping him during these crucial times. At one point, Lee would even go in and out of foster care homes. Because of all these troubles, Lee never got a proper education in school, but he did grow up and in 1973, he finally became 21 years old. Among the people that Lee knew, they describe him as a quiet, 
friendly guy. He was also only five foot two, so he wasn't a big intimidating man at all. Now by this time being 21 years old, he had to get a lot of odd jobs. At one point to make ends meet, he even became a barker for a strip club, or I guess in today's translation, that's like a promoter that stands outside on the street to get customers. Now this is when the story starts with Lee's crazy life story. One day, I guess Lee was in his break time and he was in the back room of this club that he worked at and his manager had a gun. This was one of his first times seeing a gun or even having or holding a gun. So he was really intrigued and asked the manager, hey, can I just kind of like see it? And in the back rooms, he would be playing with this gun and he says that accidentally he fired it to the walls of the club. Of course, no one was hurt, but he says that he was curious and it was just a pure accident. Now, five days would go by. He thought nothing of it, but that's when police came to his door and arrested him. But he was shocked to find out that he was actually being charged for murder. And in the main examination forensic records, the authorities wrote that the gun that Lee accidentally shot into the wall was the same bullet as the one that was found in the victim. The victim was a 31 year old member of a Chinese gang. And according to the prosecutors, the story goes that there were two Chinese gangs that was kind of in tension with each other. And one of the Chinese gangs hired Lee to be a hitman because the victim borrowed $10,000 from the them and he never paid them back. Because of this money situation and Lee was hired, a Korean man was hired by the Chinese to do the deeds. But the main evidence that they used was a lineup of the suspects, kind of like how they used to do back in the days in the movies. And Lee was number five in the lineup and you see there's different Asians. Like honestly, even me looking, I'm like, they kind of looked similar. Like me as an Asian saying that. The gun was actually pointed right at the witnesses. He began to run down, to run down Pacific in this direction, throwing away the gun in Beckett Alley. He then turned at the corner and disappeared. All of that confusion, all of that trauma, three seconds. And that's what led to Cho So Lee being put away for 10 years. But let alone the three witnesses that the police brought due to this identification were all Caucasian male. Not to mention this lineup happened months later. So these witnesses, would they really be able to point the right person among the row of people who seem to look alike? And really interesting, there were actually many people that supposedly witnessed the scene because it happened in like middle of Chinatown and they never called not one Asian witness. Someone that would be able to identify another Asian a bit more clearly compared to other races who might not be able to identify the details of other races than yours. And among the community in Chinatown, like everybody knew as rumors and people that spoke gossiping knew that Lee probably wasn't the murderer because it wasn't usual to have a Chinese gang hire a Korean man to do this. I guess back then also it wasn't usual for different ethnic races to mix in together. And a lot of people who knew Lee just knew that he was not that type of guy. And I was surprised to hear that back then, witnesses also couldn't come forward because they were being threatened by other gang members and being involved in something like this would just bring trouble to your family. Lee, of course, thought that this would be all a misunderstanding that would be cleared up and he maintained his innocence. Lee says that even one of the officers who looked at Lee and said, yes, that Chinese man. And this happened multiple times throughout the trial with the witnesses and the officers where they would refer to him as a Chinese man when he was not even Chinese, he was Korean. But of course, this was also all back in the days when they didn't really care what ethnicity you were. If you looked Asian, you were Chinese. Most people didn't even know Korea existed. And frankly, racism played a huge role in putting him behind bars because he was found guilty of murder. Lee was now sentenced to the maximum, one of the harshest prison system in California. And he describes the prison system as one of the times when gangs were all at war with each other. And he was actually one of the only Asians, especially Korean in this prison system. And Lee said there were the white gangs, the Mexican gangs, the African-American gangs, and no Asian gangs. And he was left to fend for his own. And according to him, the prison system is so bad that he saw people get murdered in prison. For Asians within the prison system, uh, the survival depends more on uh, to avoid aggression rather than to take action. 
and four years would go by being in one of the toughest prisons ever. I don't even know what his mind was going through when you're just put into this hellhole and you didn't even murder anybody, you're innocent. And on top of all of this, Lee's case would take one more turn. In prison, Lee got into a fight with what they call Aaron Brotherhood. The story goes that the man, another prison mate, secretly had a knife and tried to attack Lee first. Lee, in self-defense, got a hold of the knife and ended up attacking him. What happened then? He grabbed me. And the only time within the prison system, anybody who get grabbed is uh, when this, uh, when somebody trying to stab another person, that's when you try and grab somebody. Now, when Morris Needham grabbed you, why didn't you just run away? Coming out of self-survival, you know, there's no uh, place to run within the prison system. And like I said, everything just happened very too uh, quickly, really too uh, uh, trying to analyze what, the hell was, uh, what was happening at the time. Chol Su Lee was convicted of first degree murder in the Needham case. So now he had another murder charge on top of him. Getting a second murder charge inside of prison meant that he was to face the death penalty. And this was going to be even harder to fight now that he was already in the prison system anyway. This lovely lady is Ranko. She was said to be one of the real friends of Lee. She knew him from Chinatown and they were just platonic friends and Ranko had one of the most angelic personalities and hearts ever. She knew that he was not a murderer and just felt in her soul that it was so unfair for someone like him to go through this. She would play a crucial role in getting help for Lee and spreading the word. And she would send letters back and forth to Lee to give that glimmer of hope to him. Now, a Korean journalist of Sacramento, his name is K.W. Lee, heard about the story of Char Su. Being Korean American himself, he knew that he wanted to fight for discriminations in America. He went to prison himself to actually meet Lee and hearing the stories, the trial papers, he knew right then and there that this man was innocent. When he met Lee, he described him as someone very good looking, had a smile, and had a friendliness to him. And the best way to get the word out there was to get help from his own people, the Korean community in America. The young man was on probation. You see, it was an easy picking, you know. You know, it didn't look good for you anyway uh, when they came for your arrest. They said you had 41 rounds of live ammo, you had a 357 Magnum in your room, and you were on probation for felony theft. Is that a different issue or, no, you know? I mean, uh, it is a whole different issue, you know. A lot of people say, um, uh, I was not an angel on our side. At the same time, I was not the devil. But whatever I was on our side does not justify to frame a person to put him in a prison for murder he did not commit. So KW and Ranko were able to gather the help of different activists, the Korean communities, they even went to Korean churches, that's where a lot of Koreans are, and started a donation, started a fundraiser. They even got so creative as writing a song about Char Su Lee. So the whole song was about the injustice, the broken system, this innocent man behind bars. And the best thing you can do really at this moment is to get the media's attention and get as many people to back you up. This lone kid that grew up up almost on his own, now had a huge community backing him up, and he was all over the media now. Eventually, not only the Korean community, but of course other ethnic communities came together to fight for Lee's innocence. The Korean community were able to find and get a help from the American lawyer who specialized in these kind of injustice cases, and even had a private investigator that looked into all the evidence that supposedly the prosecutors had against him. They were now able to to also find more witnesses. It was actually another Caucasian man. They were able to put him through hypnosis. Now this happened now a couple years back, so he's not gonna remember. But this man went through the hypnosis, saw clear images of the memories back then. But you have seen Chol Su Lee since then. Oh yes, oh yeah. Was he one of the men? No, he wasn't. You're absolutely certain of that? I'm positive and he testified in court to try and get Lee a new trial, saying that no, the man that he saw was not Lee. And back then when the case actually happened, the media reported that the victim had a bullet hole behind the back of his head, when in actuality, in the autopsy, he was shot in the chest. So there were so many details that were missing that just people just scanned through and didn't care about. So with a lot of support, the court did award Lee a new trial six 
years later. But remember, Lee killed another prison mate, and that trial was now starting in 1979. And the knife belonged to the other prison mate, and it was himself against the prison mate and who was to die. And Lee claimed in the documentary that when he first went in for the trial and he saw the faces of the juries, he was really worried because it was like the injustice system playing around with him again. I guess what he meant by this was that he did not see any other minority or different faces in the juries. It was mostly similar race juries. Although now he had a lot of support that came to his trials, Lee was ultimately found guilty of the murder for the prison mate and sentenced to death. Now, I guess this is a different prison where you have to be. You're literally waiting death row alone. Really tricky, but he was on death row, although he did get a new trial for the first murder case, the Chinatown murder charge. But he still, again, technically had to be on death row, and he would spend every single day in the death row prison system for three years. Lee says that he waited every day for his mother's letter. And in one of the letters that he got, his mother said, you caused us nothing but trouble in my life. Three years into death row, he finally got the day for the new trial. And this time, the lawyers wanted to emphasize, especially in the media, is that Asians do matter. That not everyone looks the same and have the same life and that they deserve a proper trial. But first, they were able to go back and prove that the bullets did not come the same revolver gun. I don't know much about weapons, but they called it class characteristics of the bullet, that it didn't match the original gun that Lee actually had. So this was also overlooked during the first trial. Going back to the three witnesses, this was also questionable. Now, one of the witnesses that was called to point out Lee during the suspect lineup was actually a juvenile guard a few years Years back because the community was so small it so happened that Lee was one of the only Asians at this juvenile place that the guard used to work at so the guard did know Lee this could have caused him to be biased the second witness also originally said that the suspect had no mustache and was around five foot ten Char Su had facial hair and he was five foot two. Lee's lawyer at the time described this as cross racial identification, where another race tries to identify the suspect of another race and it's proven to be pretty inaccurate because it is harder for other races to see another race in a very accurate detailed description, which I also kind of agree with. It is easier for me as an Asian to distinguish and remember the faces of another Asian. You're most likely to notice something of the similar race and similar characteristics as you or that you're used to especially in a lineup like this where you gather people that do kind of have similar frames in their body and also similar height as well finally they were actually able to get an asian witness for the new trial and this man says that he actually did not come forward back then because he was afraid to talk again this was back when witnesses didn't want to come forward because i guess this was due to corruption again in the justice system and also gang violence. And this new Asian witness said that Lee was not the person he saw. Finally, in 1983, the juries came out with the verdict that Lee was not guilty of the Chinatown murder. After 10 years in prison, he was finally released, and here's the video of him first stepping out into freedom. But still, he wasn't totally free of the legal system yet because, remember, he was found guilty of killing his prison mates. The prosecutors did offer him a plea deal. So as long as he pled guilty, there would be no probations, nothing. Having spent prison time in his crucial youth from 21 to 31 years of age, he had to relearn what life was like and how to live as a normal man. He had to learn how to use a computer, fit in with the society. I mean, it was not easy just because you're free. But he did go on a huge tour across America to speak. He kind of became this icon and celebrity for a short time, but says that after the fame wore off, he felt incredibly lonely and lost again. Now, eventually, Lee also had to have a normal job and have a normal life. He was offered a janitor shop and an office job, but couldn't keep those jobs for long. Eventually, I believe approaching his 40s and 50s, Lee felt incredibly lonely and these feelings was just not being fulfilled. Lee would eventually rely on drugs and got addicted and claims he went back to the streets. And the people that supported Lee was incredibly disappointed, including Ranko, 
the girl that who was by his side all this time. Now she claims that one night Lee came pounding on her door asking for money, actually demanding money so that he can go and buy more substances. And since that incident, Renko says that she was so hurt by his actions, by her standing beside him for all these years and acting this way to her, she wanted to cut him off. In 1990, Lee would go back to the prison system for 18 months on a drug charge. And in 1991, Lee would join or hang out with a Chinese gang for the first time. He was actually hired, like really hired this time and was ordered to do this arson job. He took the job because he needed the money to get more substances and he went to burn somebody's office or some kind of a building and it actually backfired on him. He tried to put this building on fire but the fire caught onto him. He couldn't get out in time and he had severe burn all over his body. Again, the community felt betrayed by Lee that after all these efforts that he would just go back to the streets, especially now actually being involved in a gang. But I believe for this, he did have a deal that he would become a witness to the gangs that hired him and he I believe didn't serve any prison time. Now fast forward, Lee was in his 50s now in the 2000s. But and by then in his 50s, he did finally come out clean and wanted to really change his life. And Lee says that he's thankful for the humanity and unconditional love he received from others. Among the great pain he had to go through, something he did not ask for. And he really wanted to speak for the prison system and the justice system and how it must be changed. And in 2013, he passed away from complications resulting from his arson injuries. Which also means that the real killer of the Chinatown murder is still out there. The, that guy was never caught. And this guy, Lee, had to pay for all of that. And I do believe after this case, a lot of things had changed, especially for the Asian communities, the minorities, the ethnic groups, and that whole topic had to be discussed for there to be a real change. It is really unfortunate that Lee did have to later in life go back to the streets and not be able to live a, a true freedom life. I think he has been so traumatized and damaged so bad that it was hard for him to go back. And the story really does emphasize the importance of representation. So let me know what you guys have thought about Char Su Lee's story. If you have watched the documentary or heard about this case, leave a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching and see you in my next video.